Hey, and welcome to FutureThinkers.org, a podcast about the evolution of technology, society, and consciousness. I'm Mike Gilliland. And I'm Yuvia Ivanova. If you're new to the show and you want to get a list of our favorite books, popular episodes, and to join our community, go to FutureThinkers.org slash start. Hey guys, this is the first episode in our series on the feminine archetypes. So today we're talking about the mother archetype. But before we get into that, I want to give a little bit of a segue. So the feminine archetypes are a bit different than the masculine archetypes. And mainly that has to do with the biological realities of a woman's life. So motherhood being a big part of a woman's life. So for the time that a woman is a mother, it tends to put all of her other activities and interests second. And so... um, the feminine archetypes as a whole have more to do with physicality and with doing, whereas the masculine archetypes have more to do with ways of thinking and kind of states of consciousness. That said, um, because we're living in a different society now where women and men are quite a bit more equal than they used to be, and women are wanting to now occupy the kind of same positions of power and same jobs as men and have the same opportunities, So there's actually a lot more utility and use to have the masculine archetypes be part of the menu of options for women. So they actually have quite a bit more to choose from, but it also means they're a bit more spread too thin, which also we'll cover later on in this episode that causes some problems. Yeah. And so um, we can think of archetypes as the different roles that a woman can play or different sets of behaviors or energies. They're not necessarily personality types, but because um, in a woman's life, she often archi- uh, she often occupies uh, only a few of the archetypes at a time, they can seem like personality types. Like sometimes a woman's life will be focused really heavily on one of these roles. So, um, so today we're talking about the mother. And the mother is a really interesting archetype because she's kind of the, the primordial feminine archetype. So she not only represents motherhood as the act of bearing and raising children, the mother archetype also represents nature as a whole and the cycle of life and death. And so in a lot of ancient cultures, people didn't have such clear uh, definitions of terms, like words often meant multiple things. So when they said mother, that could mean your mother, the general mother role, it could also mean nature, and it could mean everything in existence, because uh, the pre-agricultural societies tended to see uh, all of the physical world as mother, because it, it's, it has these kinds of qualities of giving and taking away life. And um, yeah, so the mother archetype is about much more than, than giving birth. She's also a symbol of the force of creation. And uh, we'll talk about the different ways that people can manifest this force in their life, even if they don't choose to bear children. So let's talk about the the mother archetype in her fullness. What does that look like? So the mother archetype in her fullness, she's very caring, nurturing, protective. She's also all accepting and all loving. So you may have had experiences in your life when you've come to a person Uh, let's say, a psychotherapist, and they're just completely accepting of you. Like anything you say, just the worst things that you've done, and they're like, yes, it's okay. You're just human, you know, you'll get through it. You're a strong person, you'll deal with it, that's okay, you know. Or if you're grieving and if you're really upset about something, instead of trying to tell you how to fix it, they'll just give you a hug and say, it's okay, it's okay, you know, it's fine. It's okay to grieve. So it seems like professionally the mother archetype would be most useful in some of the caring kind of jobs, nursing, teacher, that sort of thing. Yeah, psychotherapist, healer, uh, those kinds of roles where kind of understanding um, and having empathy with human emotions and the different cycles of people's lives and all of their different moods um, and supporting them no matter what is very useful in those roles. So can we talk about the childhood manifestation of this archetype and what that looks like? Because we did that with all the masculine archetypes, but it's a little different for the feminine archetype. So how is it different and and what are the kind of childhood versions? So there isn't very, um, very much of a childhood version of the mother archetype because it's so intimately connected with uh, childbearing. 
and it tends to develop later in life. So even if women don't have children, this archetype tends to come about with the, with the hormones that come with puberty. So it's largely absent in children. But one way that it can manifest is a children's connection to others and connection to nature. And so we see, for example, when children uh, are taking care of animals or they take care of younger children, that would be a kind of primitive manifestation of the mother archetype. And so if children are uh, abusive of smaller children or animals, then that would be the overactive version. And if they're neglectful, uh, then it would be the passive version. Right. Okay, so what are some of the shadows? I think this is probably the, one of the more interesting things in the context of uh, our modern society and what we've been talking about previously on the podcast with Social Justice Warriors, well, the interview, the interview that we did with jo uh, Jordan Peterson. I think this is quite interesting because the shadow mother is, well, the active shadow mother is overprotective and treats a lot of society as her children and kind of takes on this role of protecting them and not viewing them as a whole person and then therefore feeling that she knows best and that she must prevent those children from going out there and getting hurt in the real world. Yeah, so um, this is obviously really useful when you have an actual mother taking care of a small child, but when you have people treating adults that way, it in a way, it denies them their sovereignty, it denies them their humanity. It says, you're a child, you're not a full person, you don't know what's good for you, I know what's good for you, so I'm going to tell you what to do. And it's, it's very condescending and it's actually oppressive. So it's not healthy for society to have this kind of manifestation. Um, and in more personal ways, this can manifest as a teacher who is overbearing, who says, you know, who denies her students uh, individual expression or expression of new ideas yeah, and you says... You select from this menu of options, you do it my way, you do it by the book, or you get an F. Yes, exactly. And I've had teachers like that. Um, so in the positive manifestation, actually, we, we didn't go through all the traits of the positive manifestation of mothers. So I want to list a few. Um, one of them is accepting people for what they are and nurturing them and allowing the full expression of what they are, regardless of what you think is right or what you think they should be doing. So an interesting example of this, we were watching uh, documentaries of this new uh, singer, uh, Billie Eilish. Oh yeah. And so uh, she's really talented, by the way. She's 16 years old, I think. And um, so she was homeschooled and her parents were completely supportive of what she wanted to pursue. So she wanted to do music and dance. And they just said, okay, you focus on that. And so she spent her whole life practicing those things. And then, you know, at the age of 13, she released a song and it became a huge hit. So, you know, if, if a child is put into a rigid school where they're not allowed to do that, that wouldn't have happened. It only happened because her parents recognized her, her talents and desires and abilities and said, okay, you focus on that regardless of what we think you should be doing. Right. So what are some examples of the active shadow mother uh, in movies and in popular media? What was that uh, character in Harry Potter? She's super neurotic uh, and Mrs. controlling. Oh, uh, she's I wearing was pink about, all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know who you're talking about. Uh, I can't remember, but I think everyone who's seen Harry Potter knows exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, so. she's extremely neurotic. She's trying to enforce rules. She says like, you can't study the dark arts. You're only going to study things academically. You're not going to practice anything. You're not going to experiment at all. We're just going to do it by the book. And she's all like, you know, very cheerful, very cheerful, but very tyrannical. So I think she's a really good example of an overbearing mother. Yeah. Or uh, in real life, helicopter mothers, soccer moms who are just overscheduling their children's lives, you know, uh, and their children are being observed at every moment. They're not allowed to just go out and play in the mud and, you know, learn their boundaries and climb and, and get dirty. And, you know, she doesn't allow her children any individuality whatsoever. Everything is just done by her schedule. Mm -hmm. I think we see this a lot because the prevalence of the soccer mom came about in kind of the millennial generation and, and we see a lot of 
young people now who have no ability to go out in the real world, make decisions for themselves and kind of handle their own lives. Mom has to come in and mediate between them and teachers and even the university. That's the case. Yeah. Uh, it produces spineless children. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. The mother in the passive shadow, what does that look like? In the shadow version, she's the distant mother. So she is, she either doesn't know how to be a mother or she is so focused on her career that she just doesn't have enough energy to be a mother, or she's neglecting her children, or she's emotionally unavailable because maybe she, her parents weren't very good at so supporting her. So in this her. case, if the kid hurts himself or herself, then mom's not going to really pay attention to, too much to that, not going to give them the proper care. Um, if they're sick, same story. Um, if they're busy focused on the career, child comes up says hey mom look at this look what i did and mom's like yeah okay you know whatever go away mm -hmm. so that's the kind of passive version yeah or in the extreme version uh the mother is just completely absent and she lets the child die or get into major trouble so uh i think it was in train spotting where the mother is a heroin addict and her baby dies in the crib because she's completely absent so that would be an extreme manifestation of this mm. archetype. Mm. So another element of the positive full manifestation of the mother that we didn't cover is the connection to nature uh, and to our bodies. So there's this concept of Kairos time and Kronos time in their Greek words. So Kairos time means the natural, uh, the time as it relates to, first of all, how you experience it personally and to the cycles of life. So it's how we experience day and night, the summer and winter cycle, uh, menstrual cycles, um, the cycles of uh, any kind of, kind of natural change that happens. For example, even just something, oh yeah, the, the waking and sleeping cycle, things like that. And, and Kronos is basically linear time, right? Clock like time. A, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sequential. Uh, yeah, and it's not as it's experienced, but as the clock says. So if you feel like five minutes has passed, but the clock says it's 10, then it's 10. <laughs> and so the mother energy connects to the natural experience of time. So we, we connect to this energy when we come in tune with our bodies. For example, a natural sleeping rhythm. So when people try to force themselves, for example, if they're working night shift, then they have to force themselves to be awake at night and asleep during the day. And this is at odds with a natural cycle. But then if they stop working this kind of job, uh, their body will naturally adjust and recover to the normal sleeping cycle where they're awake during the day and asleep at night. And so that's the mother energy as well. And that's, again, the mother as nature herself, where she just restores. The other way that this manifests is when people take care of their body and feel what their body needs, they become healthier. So that's the nurture aspect. So for example, um, some people might intuitively feel that certain foods make them feel not very good. Um, for example, some people don't like eating a lot of bread. And if you just listen to your body, your body will tell you what you should and shouldn't be eating. Or when you eat a lot of sugar, it might really spike your mood and then experience a low. So if you listen to your body and realize, oh, that doesn't make me feel good, I'm going to stop doing that, then you will feel healthier. If so, you allow yourself to rest, you know, if you allow yourself to relax and not just pushing yourself, stressing yourself all the time, your body will naturally recover. So what does this have to do with the, the mother archetype? So this is the, the mother archetype in her kind of um, non-specific manifestation. So we talked at the beginning with how ancient cultures didn't just see mother as a specific mother. They also saw her as nature as a whole. So that would be connecting to this impersonal aspect of the mother archetype. Right. So mother nature heals that kind of idea or spending time in nature that just makes you feel good. Yeah. And so another, uh, another quality of the mother archetype is selflessness and self-sacrifice. And also another quality that relates to this is relating to people as a whole, like humanity as a whole to people as collective. So they say a mother loves all of her children equally. So this can mean in specific terms, like a, an actual mother treating all of her children equally. But also it can mean that 
a person who embodies the mother archetype looks out at the world and sees all people, all beings as equal. And this can get into a bit more kind of spiritual esoteric territory, like all beings are equal in the eye of God, where like every being deserves life and, and respect and, and love and sort of seeing how all beings are equal in a way, even if they're different in their abilities and manifestation, they're equal in essence. And that's kind of the great mother, mother earth energy. Do you think this relates to the problem of, of the active mother shadow wanting equality of outcome rather than equality of opportunity? That's a great point, actually. So that would be the shadow version of this uh, collective mother archetype. But the positive version would be somebody like Mother Teresa, who, who wants peace and, and love for everyone, but doesn't impose her will for how people should be acting in their life. Right. Yeah, she's just providing love and compassion for all. And, you know, Mother Teresa said, um, if you have a war rally, don't invite me, I won't come. If you have a peace rally, please invite me. So it's that kind of attitude, like, I'm not going to fight. I'm just going to support peace and, and love and compassion. So... Final couple of questions here. What happens if you're in any of the shadows? How do you actually manifest the mother in her fullness? Yeah, that's a bit of a difficult question because it requires self-awareness and it also requires being open to the feedback from other people. It's almost like it's nature being ignored or shut off. Like it's an unnatural thing to not be following these archetypes and which is I find I find a really interesting comparison to the masculine archetypes men have to initiate and they have to have some sort of either cultural or internal uh drive to self-initiate and women get initiated by nature by external events and it's not necessarily an internal drive unless there's like a lot of pre-planning to become a mother but that's not always the case in a lot of cases, it's just like, here you go, you're initiated, done. So it's interesting, the difference in that one, that it's kind of an external versus internal selection. Yeah, and so this is actually a really good way to put it. So in many mystical traditions, the masculine is associated with thought and human will, and the feminine is associated with nature and the cycles of life and death. So to access the feminine, you allow you surrender, but to access the masculine, you have to increase your will and to increase your thought. So when you are a mother or occupying one of the shadow versions of the mother, you're actually ignoring instinct. Is that, would you say that's true? I think that's partially true, yeah. but sometimes there's other things at play. Like with a distant mother, sometimes there's trauma at play, right. or maybe the, the girl wasn't mothered herself properly. So she even if she relaxed into what is quote unquote natural, she's just lacking that, that mothering from her own mother. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's not as easy as that, but I would say that as a rule of thumb, the, the feminine is more about surrendering into it rather than forcing it. Whereas the masculine is more about force. And so at the, Earlier on, I brought up the kind of social justice warrior, protect the weak, uh, overbearing mother wanting to protect all of civilization and sort of enforcing this like equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity. How can you know if you've crossed over into that territory? Because it's kind of a very nebulous, like unclear uh, transition into the active shadow mother. So how do you know when you're doing the right job as a mother, protecting your kids, versus when you're overbearing and you're applying too much protection to them? Well, one useful thing that I can think about is studying biology and evolutionary psychology to understand how humans lived for most of our history, especially before agriculture. Because during the ag agricultural age, culture became a lot more important than nature. And so in every culture, there are different norms and people are conditioned according to that culture, which sometimes goes against their nature. And so this, I would say, is one of those cases where in the Western culture, it became normal to 
overprotect children and to over schedule them and to push them in this kind of way instead you know, of allowing them to develop in their own. You know what's interesting now is that there's this suppression of the masculine archetypes, right? And this not only hurts boys and men, but it hurts women as well. It's almost as if our society needs more of that healthy masculine archetype um, incorporation into the lives of both men and women for women to go through some of the, the same initiatory practices that men have to go to, through. So the warrior, the the magician, I think the lover kind of comes naturally. The king, you, you know, there are versions of this feminine archetype framework where each of the masculine archetypes has its polar opposite in the feminine, but the one we're talking about is not really based in that way. So I, it's almost like I think we need a healthier version of the masculine archetypes for both genders. And then the feminine one, especially from the mother's perspective, the mother needs to be aware of that full range because a lot of the masculine archetypes actually require that that kind of push out into the wilderness to be on your own. And the mother has to know that you've got to go out there, you've got to push them out and then let them go. And again, I kind of think about that movie 300 where the mother has to like let go of the child to go out, you know, through that initiatory practice to become a Spartan warrior. Yeah, exactly. And that, again, has to do with allowing instead of clinging and forcing. Yeah. So why don't we talk about some of the examples of the mother archetype in popular culture, just to give people some kind of uh, ways to think about it. Sure. Uh, so I think of Galadriel from Lord of the Rings. She is considered to be, I think, the most powerful elf, and she's one of the oldest elves. So she's this archetypal earth mother who embodies grace and kind of life-giving energy, but she, she can also protect when necessary. Um, of course, there are a lot of Greek goddesses as well and, and other kinds of goddesses that embody the mother archetype. For example, the Shakti Kali uh, goddesses in Hinduism. And they're kind of representing the two sides of the mother goddess, where Shakti represents this kind of nurturing, caring aspect, and Kali represents the more destructive aspect, where she becomes more uh, of a warrior mother. And then, of course, Gaia in ancient Greece, which many people associate with you know, the New Age movement or hippies. Uh, and that's, you know, literal representative of Mother Earth. You had some examples from uh, Malcolm in the middle. Oh, yeah. Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> You're so Russian sometimes. Malcolm in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that mother was very much like the the overbearing... Uh, active shadow mother. She was not a healthy mother. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, I don't know that the active shadow really captures the the ruthless, brutal mother. It's more like overprotecting, but she was like neglectful and uh, always angry and didn't give the proper care that she should have. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that really covers it in any of the archetypes that we've talked about. Yeah, well... The uh, the neglectful is the distant mother. She's not present or not, not responsible and not fulfilling her duties. Yeah. Or not emotionally present for people. And then There's the gotta be angry... an archetype for a mother who just has three boys. <laughs> just all boys. Because I grew up, uh, one of my best friends from, from the place I grew up with had four boys in the house at all times. And they, yeah. It was like my pastime to go egg them on to do crazy shit. And that mother was the Malcolm in the Middle mother. Totally. <laughs> yeah. um, Aunt May is another example. She is, she kind of nurses Peter Parker's wounds. Aunt May from Spider-Man. Um, gives him motherly sage advice. Um kind of takes on that mother role, even though she's not his mother. She she occupies that uh, archetype quite effectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other examples you can think of? Not really. This is a tough one. I think, I mean, most popular media and kind of storytelling takes on the masculine archetype 
uh, kind of character arc. So it's really difficult to find the equivalent. Like even when females are being, their stories being told in the same kind of hero context, it's always occupying the masculine archetypes again. It's not, you know, just going through the normal life cycle of become a mom and, you know, the, all that stuff. It's just like they go, they cross the threshold, they become the hero, they they go into the belly of the beast, they have to tackle all kinds of crazy uh, you know, problems and go to the brink of death and have to occupy the warrior, the magician, the not always the lover, definitely the king. So they have to go through all these things, whether they're men, a man or a woman, they have to do the same thing. So, I mean, this is a really interesting point about this whole feminine masculine archetype thing, because the we think of the masculine as for men, but it's really not. Um, and it's more relevant nowadays to women than ever before because women are not so much into that traditional cycle and role of women. It often, I mean, if you want to be a mother, then you're kind of forced into it. If you don't, if you want to be a career woman, then you're kind of forced into this like masculine archetype kind of setting. Mm -hmm. And some of the other feminine archetype archetypes um, are more connected to masculine energy or uh, enable this kind of professional development more. But the mother is definitely the least of them. Right. All right. So I think that probably will wrap this one up, right? Yeah. Cool. If you guys haven't seen uh, the other episodes in the archetype series, I encourage you to check them out. You can find the links in the description of this video, or if you're listening on audio, then you can go to the show notes page and you'll hear the uh, link for that in a moment. Cool. See you in the next one. Okay, bye. bye. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and mood. To get 10% off, use the code FUTURE at checkout. And to learn more about neurohacking, visit futurethinkers.org slash neuro. Thanks for tuning in to Future Thinkers. For all the books, resources, and mentions from this episode, go to futurethinkers.org slash 77. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to get notified of new videos. You can also follow us on social media to stay connected. If you'd like to get a t-shirt like the new Make America Think Again, go to futurethinkers.org slash store. If you like what we do and you want to help us make more podcasts and videos, consider donating or becoming a patron at futurethinkers.org slash support. Also visit our sponsor Qualia and use the coupon code FUTURE to get 10% off your purchase.